Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for our Hard Histories conversation. My name is Ellie Palazzolo, and I'm a PhD candidate in history at Johns Hopkins, studying 19th century US cultural and social history. Launched in fall of 2020, the Hard Histories at Hopkins project examines the role that racism and discrimination have played at Johns Hopkins. Blending research, teaching, public engagement, and the creative arts, Hard Histories aims to engage our broadest communities at Johns Hopkins and in Baltimore, in a frank and informed exploration of the myths that have become part of our university story, as well as to offer evidence of how race and racism have shaped Johns Hopkins. In spring 2023, we are hosting a series of conversations exploring the histories of Blackness, slavery, and racism in the Maryland area and beyond. Today, we are excited to host a discussion about writing hard histories in the Baltimore area. We invite our panelists now to turn their cameras on. We are honored to have with us today two great panelists in discussion with Hard Histories Project Director, Dr. Martha S. Jones. Our first panelist, Dr. Andrew Jewett, is the lead author on an institutional history of Johns Hopkins that will appear in conjunction with the university's 150th anniversary in 2026. He earned his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 2002, and has authored two books, Science, Democracy, and the American University from the Civil War to the Cold War, with Cambridge University Press in 2012, and more recently, Science Under Fire, Challenges to Scientific Authority in Modern America, published with Harvard University Press in 2020. Before coming to Hopkins last July, Dr. Jewett taught at Harvard for 10 years and held a variety of other teaching positions and fellowships. Our second panelist, Dr. Kenneth J. Lee Partito, is currently co-writing along with Dr. Patricia Watson, a biography of John McDonough. McDonough was a 19th century enslaver and slave trader in the Baltimore area. Money from McDonough's estate ultimately founded the namesake McDonough School in Owings Mill, Maryland. Dr. Lee Partito is professor of history at Florida International University. He has also held academic positions at Middlebury College, Rice University, and the University of Houston. Dr. Lee Partito earned his PhD in history from Johns Hopkins University. A specialist in business and economic history, as well as the history of technology, his work, gives, his work focuses on the interactions of economic institutions, politics, and culture. His scholarship has received support from the National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Hagley Museum and Library, as well as CIFAR. From 2003 to 2007, he was editor of the journal Enterprise and Society, the International Journal of Business History. Finally, Dr. Martha S. Jones is the Society of Black Alumni Pr Presidential Professor, Professor of History, and Professor at the SNF Agor Institute at Johns Hopkins University. She is a legal and cultural historian whose work examines how Black Americans have shaped the history of American democracy. Jones is the author of Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All, and has been selected as one of Time's 100 Must Read Books for 2020. So Dr. Jones and our panelists are going to be in conversation for about 25 minutes before we turn to your questions. Um, please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A function on Zoom. Live captioning will be available to audience members and we are posting a link in the chat to the live transcript URL. Thank you, Dr. Jewett and Dr. Lee Partito for being here. Now I'll turn things over to Dr. Jones and see you all again at the end of our discussion. Well, good afternoon and thanks so much, Ellie. Um, it's great to have you back uh, with us on the webinar and uh, I'm looking forward to next week when Ellie and I are doing a road trip together to Richmond to do some hard histories research. So it's always great to have you with us and we appreciate all you bring to the project, Ellie. Um, and gentlemen, um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you too. Um, I think I have been imagining this conversation for a very long time. Um, you know, you're both very busy people. Um, so we're just thrilled that you uh, made time, particularly at this time of year to be with us. And I know folks are thrilled to be hearing from you. Um, as I was getting ready, um, I was remembering some of where this work began for us uh, back in uh, the fall of 2020. Um, and partly it was uh, unraveling a, a, a kind of thread that had gotten us to some misunderstandings about the history of um, Mr. Hopkins and the university's origins. Um, we were, like many people, fascinated by a 1929 book 
called Johns Hopkins, a, a silhouette which is really a collection of reminiscences and family lore collected by a descendant of Mr. Hopkins, a great niece, published in 1929, republished in 2009 from Johns Hopkins University Press. And we discovered the way in which um, that sort of hagiography um, got carried over into institutional histories um, but none of it had really been subject to um, examination, to scrutiny by academic um, historians. And so that's really where you all come in, um, in the midst, both of you, in really important work, um, rethinking historical figures, rethinking um, institutions, and um, bringing your expertise and your critical perspectives to that work. And so we're really excited to learn more about what it means when you bring your academic perspectives to these histories that um, in many ways we hold very close um, as members of a university or a, a school community more generally. Um, so I want to hear more about these works in progress um, on Johns Hopkins, the institution on John McDonough, the man. Um, but I thought maybe we'd begin just inviting you to introduce yourselves a bit. Um, we've heard a little bit about your bios and maybe nothing in your bios would um, suggest that you would be um, up to here in these histories, um, but here you are. So maybe Dr. Jewett, I, I could talk with you and a, a bit and just ask you to tell us something about your journey and um, the parameters of this history that you are leading um, here at Hopkins. Yeah, let me, uh, thank you, Dr. Jones, for uh, having me here under the whole Hard Histories team for making this event happen. Uh, it was actually the first time I've had a chance to talk publicly about the project. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts and those of the audience. Uh, the journey in a way that brought me to the project, um, and I'll say a few words about the parameters in the end, but it didn't really start with me. This book was commissioned by the current president of Johns Hopkins, Ron Daniels, um, designed, as you said uh, in the introduction, as Ellie said, to coincide with the 150th anniversary. And when the president was thinking about what he wanted, he didn't just put the work in the hands of a professional scholar, as he's done with you at Hard Histories, but also a scholar uh, with no prior connections to John Sopkins at all. I had written two books and all kinds of shorter pieces on questions about the public roles of scholarship and higher education in the United States. Um, <clears throat> most of those have focused on the complicated interactions, both real and perceived, between science and politics. Uh, but I had no special knowledge of Johns Hopkins. I'd never even come here to give a talk. I'd never even been mm -hmm. on a campus. Uh, and that's it's hard to overstate how unusual that decision was by the president to hire an outsider to write a university history. Most of them are written by scholars who already work at the university in question. Um, and they're not always specialists in modern US history, let alone the history of higher education. They have a lot of personal experience. Um, often they come from other subfields of history. Sometimes they're from adjacent disciplines like English or sociology. Usually they are longtime faculty members who are at or near retirement age and have time to pursue the project as a kind of labor of love. But President Daniels chose instead to put a specialist in charge. Um, and as you there have experienced, he's well aware of what academic historians bring to this kind of work. He's always insisted that this book has to be a detailed critical analysis that everyone, including other scholars, is going to see as legitimate and authoritative. They're not going to have the kinds of questions that uh, we have about Johns Hopkins, a silhouette, right, by Helen Tom, mm -hmm. you're mentioning. Um, but it isn't just legitimacy either, maybe even more, uh, the, the point is utility. The, the goal of the book is to provide what President Daniels calls a history of record, uh, a reliable account of the past that university leaders and everyone else uh, can draw on for guidance in their future decisions and actions. So to the extent possible, given the sources, uh, we have to get this history right. If we want a history that's useful, as well as legitimate, that's reliable and worthy of trust, then it, it needs to include both the good and the bad in the university's past. And a big part of this, as professional historians now realize, of course, uh, is bringing in all the different voices and viewpoints, not just channeling the perspectives of administrators or faculty or students, but also accounting for the views of community members, hospital patients, asylum residents, 
employees, neighbors, uh, students denied admission or treated poorly, professors denied tenure. Uh, so we need all those voices. And this vision of a serious scholarly history of record and include truly inclusive history in some ways sets the parameters for the project as well. It has to be both comprehensive and easy to follow so that it can be used in this way. It needs to be inclusive rather than episodic. Uh, it needs to be organized roughly chronologically rather than thematically so that the story can be followed. Really, the, the, the two big structural issues that were up in the air still when I arrived were first just how to actually do it, how to organize a research team to make this happen in a short period of time. And then the exact scope of the narrative should the book stick to the Homewood campus and its offshoots, or should it include the medical institutions in East Baltimore? And I think everyone agreed that even though it's going to take more work, the book is going to be much uh, less interesting and less useful if it doesn't include teaching and research at the medical school, public health, nursing. Those are such big parts uh, of how the Johns Hopkins Enterprise writ large does its work in the world. So that's the scope. I'm, I'm expecting that Dr. Lipartito is, is hearing echoes um, of his <laughs> own um, thinking here, but I'm going to let you, if I could, Dr. Lipartito, just um, tell us a little bit about your journey to this and um, and what the parameters of your project is today. Yeah, uh, yeah, there definitely are echoes uh, in everything that both Martha, you said, and Andrew, you said. So, and again, thank you so much, Dr. Jones, for having me. We've talked about this project in several other venues, and I've learned an incredible amount from what you've done, especially with uh, hard histories that's really informing, you know, where we're going with, uh, with this project. So, uh, so I came about uh, this project uh, for in a couple of ways. One, one because I, I have some friends of mine actually teach at McDonough School, some graduates of Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, people that I knew, and I knew that they were interested in uh, their 150th uh, anniversary history. And so, so that was part of what brought me to it. Uh, and I have done institutional histories for other organizations, uh, the Kennedy Space Center, for example. Uh, so I have an interest in institutional histories, not necessarily educational ones, but I thought it could still be an interesting story. And it was in the course of developing that project, which is ongoing and will result in a, in a institutional history of the 150th, uh, you know, 150 uh, years of uh, the McDonough School, that the uh, issue of John McDonough himself came up, uh, which was known. It was known that John McDonough uh, was a slaveholder who made his money in uh, from Baltimore, who made his money in New Orleans, and then uh, uh, used at least part of his fortune to found the school, as well as the public school system in New Orleans, as well as other uh, ventures. And the question, of course, of how to manage that uh, history of someone who, who made money through slavery um, arose almost immediately in, in during the course of the school history. And originally, we had suggested that perhaps that could be dealt with in, in an introductory chapter, in part because, like with uh, John Johns Hopkins, there had been an early hagiography of uh, John McDonough by the uh, first headmaster of the school, which was then written into the story of the school, including being picked up by a later, a still uh, alive uh, alumni, a, a Baltimorean uh, who's been a major donor to the school, who essentially wrote a, a, a new version of the same story, picking up the same themes of how he was actually not that involved in slavery. He's a kindly master and, you know, the usual apologetics. Uh, for slavery, it was only when we started researching, especially the extensive John McDonough business archives in uh, New Orleans, that it became apparent that his involvement in slavery was not, in fact, tangential or secondary, that it was central to who he was. And that led to a sort of second project, and that is to write a biography, a full-scale biography of the man, a complex figure, to be sure, uh, in order to, uh, you know, to essentially tell the truth about history uh, for, for the school uh, that has not changed its name. There was some discussion of whether it should. It has now a slave, a memorial to enslaved people on its campus, but that memorial sits uh, next to and across from the uh, rather large, uh, you know, white marble monument of John McDonough standing in front of the main <laughs> Uh, old building of campus as you come up their, their drive, under which the uh, remains of John McDonough are interred. So, so the question of how to both, um, you know, respect this long tradition of the McDonough School 
yet to be honest about its connection to slavery it has led to this uh, biography project. Uh, and maybe I'll stop there because you probably can ask more questions that could get us deeper into some of these issues. Yeah, well, and you're already, um, you know, hinting at um, one of the challenges is that there are implications in many quarters of the institution then for the history that you uncover, the history that you write, um, from the questions of naming um, to memorialization and monuments, um, all things that many, many institutions are thinking about, um, but they take on a kind of poignancy and, and, and even a sharp edge I think, in the face of some of the very careful work you're doing. So um, thanks for flagging that for us. Um, let me stay with you, if I could, Dr. Libertito, and just ask you to um, just flesh out a bit um, how it is that you're working. Um, one of the things I know is that um, you're writing with a co-author, um, something that for some historians um, <laughs> sends a chill um, <laughs> up our spine. Um, but um, how are you going about approaching this process. Um, I know that you're you're there uh, on campus in Florida. You have your your day job, so to speak. Um, but what does the research entail and, and how are you approaching that? So uh, it's interesting because I've actually written quite a number of books with co-authors. And I think more historians should do it, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're kind of like uh, holdouts on the single author monograph. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's like anything else, you, you learn how to do it. But I have a very good relationship with my co-author, Patricia Watson, another, by the way, Johns Hopkins PhD from about my, my era, although oddly enough, we did not know each other when we were both uh, uh, graduate students in the history department for various reasons. And uh, you know, Patricia has been a professional writer pretty much her whole career, decided not to go into academia, decided, in fact, to, to, to become an independent scholar, and it's actually done quite quite well uh, writing multiple uh, institutional and business histories. So uh, so part of it is, I think, the common training in the Hopkins seminar. Uh, but I've also worked with other co-authors. Uh, and uh, some of it is is just being able to, you know, there's a certain amount of ego that has to be let go, I think. And so the way we have generally worked, and I think we'll work on this project, is that is that while one person may take a principal role in uncovering some of the primary source material and another person may take more time on the secondary literature that ultimately we share everything that we do. So writing a book with a co-author is not writing half a book. It may be writing two and a half books, right? It may be, it may be uh, or at least one and a half books. It may be uh, you know, uh, more, more work in some ways if you, wanna, if you wanna do it right. And then passing back and forth chapters with each other uh, so that a different eye looks at the same material and is embedded enough in the literature, even though there has to be some specialization in order to you know, make progress quickly in terms of who's perhaps doing what chapter who's principally uh, responsible for what section of the of the research. Uh, so, so I think there's various mechanisms that work, but that that has worked pretty well uh, for us in the past. And, and our goal is to, be, you know, when we're now deeply into the biography of John McDonough and his and his history as a slaveholder businessman, uh, part of the goal is simply to uh, organize the voluminous primary research. So we also have research assistants working on that, and uh, and part of it is uh, to figure out. What the larger themes are, as as you know, you're helping us uh, with that, and then to eventually come up. I think one thing you always do with a co-author is you come up with a very clear outline of where you want to go, even though of course it, it can change and it's flexible. And then decide in terms of some division of labor in terms of who's going to be primarily, primarily responsible for which parts of the research and we bring complementary skills i mean i'm obviously deeply trained in business history and so the business records are something i'm very, you know quite familiar with uh, patricia's done a wide range of other types of history including religious history so and mcdonough's story as a deeply religious presbyterian is an important part of understanding who he is and where he's coming from i think in terms of some of the issues dealing with say uh, slavery uh although i do teach uh, on slavery and capitalism, there's obviously aspects of that that neither of us are really experts on. Um, I'd like to believe, again, that the Hopkins old seminar method prepares you for 
moving out of comfort zones and engaging different literatures um, uh, effectively. That's been my, my experience uh, because of the nature of the training. Uh, to be open about uh, about history is not just your narrow specialization, but of a larger project uh, project of history. Uh, so those are some of the things we we are using uh, in terms of getting the work done. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things we all share is um, training and retraining ourselves in fields that um, weren't either part of our graduate training or part of our ongoing work. And um, folks here know we've been working on the history of the uh, Hop Johns Hopkins Orphan Asylum, and it has mm. been extraordinary to dive into that really rich and, and, and complicated literature. So um, there is a lot of that to go around. But let me ask you, Dr. Jewett, because you brought on a, a team of researchers. I've, I've been watching you as you've sort of put this group together. And what is that like? And, and what has that been like for you to work as part of a team um, rather than um, the more classical academic sole author approach that so many of us are more familiar with. Yeah, it's very unusual for me. I haven't done any of the uh, any co-authoring and it's uh, been really fun in a lot of ways. Uh, so there were a number of models that were proposed early on and everything is really constrained by the time frame. Uh, uh, and as Dr. Lee Partito said, co-authoring doesn't necessarily mean a reduction of the amount of time spent by half. And so it with the kind of tightness of the schedule, we decided that it was better to go with a single author. And, you know, I'm not teaching while I'm writing this. I'm not doing any of my own research. This is a, a full-time position. And I also have two experienced historians working with me full-time on the project, which was my way of sort of trying to have the best of both worlds is to have professional writers on the staff, but to have one person be responsible for the actual text itself. Um, because this is, again, supposed to be done well, but very, very quickly. We're really shooting for May of 2025 so that we can send it around to some colleagues to get some feedback ahead of the actual delivery date to the press in January 2026. And this is supposed to be when it's printed a six to 800 page book uh, starting from scratch, uh, mm -hmm. me without the rest of the team last July. Um, so I did hire two experienced researchers. They're at, at the postdoctoral level, more or less, but they're not just out of graduate school, each one, in fact, has already published a book. And, you know, I can imagine some scholars would be frustrated by that situation. We're not used to working with others. You know, these people have their own ideas. They don't just do what I tell them and then bring it back to me. But I find that extremely helpful um, to be able to set them loose and to trust that they're going to make good decisions. Uh, and I can also get their views on what I'm doing just from one working historian to another. They're not afraid to tell me you know, hey, that title idea is awful, or your plan for storing oral histories just isn't going to work. We have to do it like this. Uh, it's not only the case that I haven't done this kind of book before on this sort of timetable as an outsider, but no one, as far as I know, has ever done it on this kind of timetable, let alone as an outsider. So that, to me, that kind of trust and feedback from the team has really been crucial. Thanks for bringing up the time question, because um, you know, one of the things that happened in our work at Hard Histories very early on, you know, was a, a, a negotiation, if not a tussle even, over the, the timeline for the work. You know, I, I wanted to say, you know, I, you know, give me six years or, or give me 16 years. You know, there's a lot <laughs> here. And that is you know, in a way, the kind of timetable we're used to. So, um, it, it, Dr. Jewett, like, how did you, how did you think about time? And, 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 and you have a kind of, um, a very clear um, objective, which is this 2026 anniversary for Johns Hopkins. Yeah, it really has. We really had to work backward from those kinds of deadlines and everything that we've done. It shaped decisions on what kinds of people to hire for research help. It shaped decisions about how to structure the time once they're here. I mean, we still have right, the big variable, of course, is I think uh, not just all of the archival material here, uh, which is daunting enough, but archival material at other institutions 
simply the job of finding relevant material and, and then deciding what's useful, let alone actually going to take a look at it is, is uh, a very, very intensive, you know, many months sort of process. And so we're trying to find ways of deciding how to prioritize material within that. We're trying to be very closely guided by a set of very specific research questions uh, so that we know exactly what we're looking for to help us cut through just the, the kind of mindless waiting that can be part of archival work. Yeah. Um, it makes me also think, uh, Dr. Libertito, about audience, right? that, um, you know, our peer audience might uh, not blanch at all at the notion that you would propose six years for a book. They might even think that was that was kind of um, accelerated as a timetable. But you've got a different kind of audience for this book. Yes, our peers, we'll talk more about that. Um, but the community, both present and past at the McDonough School, for example, how do you talk with them about how long it takes for a historian to do the kind of work you're doing? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question. I, I have done contract histories before, and contract histories are always done on a timetable. Two, two years, which usually seems, if it's a private corporation or, or even a government agency, seems like interminable to them and of course seems like incredibly rushed uh for historians so so some of it is just is i think you know i think we love the leisure of being uh, uh you know being able to sit down for a day and just go through a book and think and and so you you do lose some of of that kind of you know i mean that leisure could be creative i'm not saying it's not mm -hmm. uh but i think if your your point about audience is exactly right uh, that you have to think, well, what, who, who is the audience for this? Now, to the extent that we're writing uh, about the uh, anniversary history of McDonough, I mean, the audience is the institution, the, the, the teachers, the, the, the administrators, the, the huge alumni. And of course, that brings in voices that often have a certain perspective. And we certainly had to negotiate, although it is a kind of, it, it, I, I don't like this term warts and all, as though there's only two choices, either no warts or warts, but but it is a, it is an honest time that we deal with some very difficult material, you know, including the racism, the segregation, uh, the uh, the uh, certain other uh, events that happened that are actually still circulating in Baltimore newspapers, and they and they and they said no, you can't shy away from those because we understand that that will undermine the sense of credibility, and even in institutional history, this I think as Dr. Jewett has said. That getting the facts and the credibility right is is crucial, and and once an institution buys into that, I think that really makes things a lot easier. Likewise, with the story of John McDonough, slaveholder, once they realize that telling the truth factually with professional, deep historical research is actually great value to them, mm -hmm. even though there will be the people on the sidelines who complain. <laughs> Uh, and as you can imagine, I'm sure you know this. Have, I know this has happened with John Hopkins' uh, its history. There are those who are in the kind of you know anti woke phase. Like, why are we bringing up all this past history? Isn't this just going to make the institution look bad? If the leadership, you know, is willing to take that heat and and make the case that the honest telling of history adds so much more value than worrying about things that you know might upset somebody. Then I think the project can succeed, and so far that's been my experience. I, and I will also say, and I think this is the point Dr. Druid is also making back to Ron Daniels, is that uh, you know if you do this, you actually learn things, you actually bring the past in a way that is useful for thinking about the present. And I guess I'll take a little bit of an exception to my friend and former colleague Jim Sweet's <laughs> point about presentism. I actually think that there's done right there, if you want to call it presentism, there's nothing wrong with with bringing the past in a way that is useful to say current decision makers or people trying to manage difficult issues like race and racism and slavery or simply, you know, move their institution on to the next uh, to the next stage of history. Yeah, and and we won't uh, we won't digress uh, um, I, 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 at least not today um, into the uh, story of um, Jim Sweet, who was uh, until recently president of the American Historical Association, and some of his criticisms of um, what I take to be um, the ways in which um, he regards some of us as as thinking 
um, about the past through a, 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 the lens of the present. Maybe we can drop a, a link to his piece in the chat if folks want to um, follow up. But it is it takes me really to my next question, which is about um, that other audience, um, and that is the audience of um, other academic historians, um, because I think there's a way in which um, you know I really I really avoid or try and avoid on our webinars. Um, too much, you know, sort of insider baseball, too much jargon. So I'm going to say historiography and then apologize for um, for that term. But it's to say that um, one of the other audiences for you all is certainly um, other historians, some of them very closely associated with the institutions you're looking at, and others of them, your colleagues and peers across the country and across the world. Um, and so how do you think about your work in relationship to um, the historiographic debates, historians' ongoing conversations about the past, whether it's the history of higher education, the history of philanthropy, um, of slavery and racism. Um, there are many ways in which your work at least invites that kind of um, academic thinking about the past. And, and I guess for me, I think it's one of the, um, it's one of the reflections uh, about doing this work is, do we want to, is it important that the work not, if you will, only be institutional history, right? That, but that it speak also um, to these bigger audiences. Um, so maybe Dr. Jewett, can I ask you to take a stab at that and, we'll, and then we'll come back to Dr. Libertito. Yeah, it's a really interesting question because you obviously want your work to speak to as wide an audience as you can, both scholarly and otherwise. I mean, and <clears throat> there's a way in which I, I sort of imagine the work that we're doing is standing at the intersection of two kind of big bodies of historical literature, not even historical, scholarly literature uh, that are starting to converge, although they come from very different places institutionally and to some extent kind of socially. Um, one, there's a, a big body of work by professional historians of education on the development of the system of research universities in the U.S., and that's been focused on questions that revolve around kind of structural transformations in this model of the American research university itself, which was, of course, new uh, with Hopkins and then others in the late 19th century. So there's been a lot of attention to that founding period, the late 19th century, early 20th. Uh, where lots of universities either are founded as or become these large research intensive kinds of outfits. Then a second moment in the mid 20th century around World War II and the Cold War, where these massive new streams of federal funding uh, institutions sort of change themselves around in order to take advantage of those new flows. And there are lots of different sorts of arguments that swirl around those transitions. How was religion implicated? What was you know, whether was this an exception in the relationship to government or in some ways more continuous. Now there are debates about whether there's something new going on since the 70s and 80s, some kind of academic capitalism or something like that. And along the way, there's been occasional work uh, by that group of people on questions of discrimination and inclusion, but a lot of it has involved women uh, or Jews, Catholics, other religious groups. It's not that anyone was unaware of racial discrimination, but it has often just been taken for granted as a kind of background feature um, with not a lot of detailed attention to sort of its full contours, how it was challenged, or the connection of broader dynamics like the creation of racialized spaces in a city like Baltimore. Um, and so I'm trying to bring that into, uh, in the context of a single institutional history into dialogue with another group of scholars, uh, often coming from bases, uh, in fields like black studies, urban studies, have gone into the archives in recent years to, to show just how integral and constitutive race has been across the entire system of US higher education, the profound effects, as you well know, of enslavement and subsequent forms of structural racism, the impact of research universities and medical centers on surrounding communities, uh, often the racist presumptions and effects of academic theorizing itself. So, in a new way, showing the connection of universities to national dynamics, not just politics, economics, maybe war or religion, but also this structuring principle of race. So I'm trying to embody in this one history, the deepening intersection of those two streams so, so that the book will at once address the changing structure of Johns Hopkins as a leading research university, but also 
keeping constantly in mind the shifting but persistent forms of inequality that it's helped to enforce both practically and ideologically to try to bring out and then knit together those themes into a single narrative. Yeah, I, this for us is incredibly exciting. So um, thank you for that. And, you know, maybe Dr. Lupartito, I heard a little bit of your answer already when you tell us, for example, that you teach a course on um, slavery and capitalism. Um, I, I'm already imagining that um, a close look at John McDonough um, is, I guess, in a sense, a, a, another chapter in, in that story. But say a little bit more about how you're thinking about how the work fits with the ongoing work in the fields that are sort of um, implicated by the research. Yeah, of course. Uh, so especially uh, when, now that we're really digging deep into what will be a book on biography of John McDonough, this is much more aimed at, uh, I would assume it's going to be a university press type book, not a not a institutional history for the institution only. So in some ways, we've eliminated some of the problems that Dr. Jewett has, which is to try to do both, uh, <clears throat> where the history of the school is a kind of uh, purely um, uh, you know, private uh, sort of thing, whereas the history of John McDonough is a scholarly. Uh, and, I've done, and I've had to do both when I did the history of the Kennedy Space Center, which was published by University Press, bringing together both the institutional history that especially people who lived through that experience wanted to hear with the larger context of science and technology and politics in the American space program uh, was extremely challenging. This makes it a little bit easier by, by separating out the two sides of the project. I, I at one point said, well, maybe the, you know, the title of this book should be, you know, slavery's capitalist, <laughs> John McDonough. Is he the perfect illustration of what has been abstracted as a kind of larger, is he the you know, instantiation of, of capitalism and slavery? Uh, now, I don't want to prejudice the work by you know, imposing that too strongly just yet, because he, he is, a, you know, we have, we have the religious side of him, we have his involvement with uh, the American Colonization Society, we have his own complex relationships with both enslaved people that he owned and also free black people in both uh, Baltimore and uh, New Orleans. And we have the reality of Louisiana itself being um, you know, somewhat uh, uh, perhaps a little bit different than uh, uh, at least in, in much, because he dies in 1850. So much of his life is lived under the French and Spanish code. He's also involved in uh, land in West Florida, which is Spanish. He speaks Spanish and French as well, or, and works in both languages. So it's in some ways opened up. I mean, not to say we're the first people to write about slavery in New Orleans or Louisiana, far from it. That's definitely going to be a deep part of the learning process of the, of the historiographical literature that we want to engage is the story of Louisiana and uh, New Orleans slavery. But it uh, it does change. It's not something I necessarily would ne teach, or because I would emphasize more the you know, Anglo part of the, the U.S. experience. On the other hand, I will say I've benefited quite a bit by being in a program here, which focuses on the Atlantic, uh, which is also part of my training at Johns Hopkins, and uh, the Atlantic with uh, very strong Latin American faculty. And so I've learned quite a bit about slavery in Latin America which I think does open up some, some new avenues for thinking about John McDonough, who's, who's embedded in New Orleans under, you know, originally pre-US pre, pre uh, US, uh, ownership, uh, and then also is working in a kind of Atlantic context in, uh, in uh, the Bahamas, uh, it seems like in pre-US Galveston, so still Spanish Galveston, uh, as well as in uh, England, and probably, although we're not quite sure how much, in Havana. So, so, uh, so in a sense, it's also opening up new avenues uh, uh, that is going to perhaps bring together a more Atlantic perspective on uh, U.S. slavery that maybe hasn't been always there. Terrific. Um, I think I have time for one more question because the the Q and A um, is filling up. So. Um, Maybe I could ask you both um, sort of a, a modest two-part question, which is one to talk about some of the challenges that you've faced in the work and 
um, and specifically um, how you think about um, academic freedom in, in work mm -hmm. like this um, that is so intimately tied to communities of interest. Um, Dr. Jewett, when I was thinking about your work, um, you know, folks who follow us know that one of the challenges is around the 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 spotty or the the modest archival record, particularly in the early years um, of Mr. Hopkins's life. But I don't know, how are you thinking about the challenges, and is is academic freedom one of them for you, Dr. Jewett? Fortunately for me, I think that is not one of our biggest challenges. I, I was, it's impossible to avoid the tremendous amount of investment that people around Baltimore have in stories about Mr. Hopkins and this institution. Um, it was, and I mean, literally immediately apparent to me when I got here, I mentioned to someone when I was unloading my moving truck at my apartment building that I was doing this. And by the time I finished unloading, there were already people grabbing me to tell me how crazy it was that people were talking about Mr. Hopkins and slavery and so forth. Um, but it, in an institutional sense, you know, I was brought in to write this project as I will within these kind of very formal parameters. And I, I feel like people ask me, historians, the minute I told anyone that I was considering this, they said, oh, are you really going to be able to do it? Or is this going to be a kind of court history. And I said, no, I'm absolutely going to be free to write this book. And I still believe that's the case. I'm even uh, yeah, less concerned about that than the tiny bit I was at the beginning. Uh, the, the, the big uh, challenges have to do with sources, uh, both paucity in some places and, and uh, abundance in others. Yeah. Dr. Libertito? Well, <laughs> I would say in some ways, working on this project, I may have more academic freedom than I do in the state of Florida right now. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, needless to say, academic freedom is at the top of my uh, of my mind. Uh, and so I haven't, I've never gone into a, a project like this in institutional history or contract history uh, where uh, I would accept, you know, being limited in terms of either what I could see or what it could write. Now, it doesn't mean you don't get some pushback, right? It doesn't mean that the people who are invested in a different narrative aren't going to challenge you. But uh, but it, as long as we agree that if I can document it, I can say it, right? Now, you know, there's questions about do you really want to go into this area or that? I mean, those have to be, I think, set fairly early. And some of them are actually much more you know, typical historical questions. Should you talk about the medical school, right? I mean, there, there are questions like that. Uh, what I found in general, even when people are deeply invested in, in uh, these matters, is of course, as long as the institution or the people that want this work done are supporting you, it, it usually works out quite well. And secondly, some of the things that they're most concerned with tend to be fairly trivial uh, <laughs> uh, matters, right? Now, slavery and John McDonough or slavery and Johns Hopkins are not trivial matters, and I'm sure there is a lot of emotion in, in, embedded in, in that. So that that's a little bit different, but some of the other issues tend to be relatively not that important. Uh, but I think if you go in with, if I can document, I can say it. If you don't, then I think you have to be prepared to kind of walk away. Uh, and that's always the approach I've taken. I, I've always said I can't distort the past. Uh, it's not public relations. If you want public relations, you probably can hire much better people than me to do PR. And that usually ends the discussion. Uh, either, either they say, no, we don't want you, or, or they say, yes, of course, we totally agree. We want the truth to come. Yeah. You know, um, I, 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 there's a question from Latonya Taylor who asks, um, I'm curious regarding how your work has been received by the public relations offices at your institutions. <laughs> you know, have you been able to work together? You know, what have some of the issues and challenges been, if any? And I, I think it's really an apt question because um, uh, it is true, certainly in our work, that, you know, we have benefited at some junctures um, from the attention right, of the public relations, um, the press arm of the institution. Um, it has given the work a kind of visibility. Um, but I think is the question, at least um, underneath this question, I think is um, a sense that that also um, can present some moments for uh, hard conversations about 
um, how to how to how to represent the work um, and what its implications are for the university or for the school um, more generally. So, Dr. Jewett, have you met the the uh, the the public relations folks at Johns Hopkins, and how do you talk with them about what you're doing and what they might do with what you're doing? I guess is a way of thinking about it. Yeah, I have met quite a number of them. I think it's going to vary to some extent by unit. Of course, as you know, there's uh, there's Johns Hopkins, but there's also all these other big pieces of it that often have their own autonomous staffs. And I suspect it will it will differ to some extent across units. But so far, um, I've had great relations with the folks I've talked to in terms of thinking toward how to integrate the book into the 150th anniversary. There's also a model that I would mention already at Hopkins that the public health school has an excellent professional historian on staff at that point, that juncture, literally working part-time in public relations and part-time on the history of the institution itself. And so that's been a, a real model for us and a, a real kind of um, uh, inspiration for how to think about the, the role of the past and the present in these same kinds of uh, messaging situations, if nothing else, but also that the ability to do really critical work within a within a strongly institutionalized frame. Yeah, Dr. Lepartito? Yeah, very similar. Uh, we, I, I think we uh, first haven't have spoken with the uh, public relations or fundraising, I guess, mm -hmm. even more arm of the institution. So they're aware from day one what was going mm -hmm. on. There's no professional historian, although there are history faculty who themselves have investigated the different times, some of the past of the, of the institution. Uh, and there is an archivist. Uh, they actually have a pretty, uh, uh, McDonough School itself has a pretty extensive archive. Um, and they do have an archivist, although the archive is, you know, in the process, let us say, of being fully uh, organized. The person who works there is a trained professional archivist. And so, the public relations fundraising uh, group has actually drawn on history at various times uh, and, and kind of depends on that uh, institutional history for some of the things they do. So I think um, being able to show them the value uh, of some of the things that we're writing, you know, more than worrying about, I mean, there's always some donors who are kind of, you know, like I say, the ones who, who have gone into the, far right of anti-wokeism maybe don't always see the value in this. But there's there's so many actually great stories too about the history of the school that that can be useful and valuable. And I think ultimately that that weight that has won out. We've been aware uh, that they face some pressure, but uh, it's never been anything that's required us to change what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Two questions, one from William Thomas and the other from Michael Reynolds, um, both of which ask about students. Um, and so um, we've talked about a lot of stakeholders, um, but not students. And one of the things that's been new for us uh, this semester on the webinar is, is including um, undergraduate students in particular in the uh, conversations that we've been having here and, and really benefiting from their work, but also their um, perspectives. Um, so Dr. Lepartito, you yourself are, um, I guess, identify as a one-time student, we all do, but, <laughs> um, but, um, but what are your opportunities to hear from and to work with current students at the McDonough School? So that's actually, uh, been one of the real, I think, achievements uh, in that, in that uh, from our work, but also from previous work that uh, others have done, they have now created essentially a unit on John McDonough in the, uh, in the American history course. And uh, there's also uh, kind of ongoing projects where students can take aspects of the school's history or aspects of John McDonough's history as, as uh, kind of independent study projects. So that seems to be something that uh, we haven't been involved in the curriculum, although we've suggested that maybe at some point we could help with dev devising a more thorough curriculum, either on John McDonough and slavery or, or the history of the school, because there are many aspects that are relevant. There's not just John McDonough's own life, but then there's the whole question of his will and the creation of the school, which itself 
gets into your area, Dr. Jones, in Baltimore and the leadership of Baltimore and how the school was actually created, which was in fact a branch uh, or was uh, under the control of the city government, uh, why it became a segregated institution, even though the will of John McDonough specified that this would be a school for orphan boys of all races and creeds, um, uh, which of course did not become true until after uh, Brown. So, um, so, so there's lots of incredible material, and I think my understanding from the teachers uh, is that students have really responded quite well to this and have really been really engaged. So, in that sense, I think there's a tremendous opportunity uh, for learning in the institution through the history. What about you, Dr. Jewett? You know, one of the things that I, I can say about you is I turn left, I turn right, and there you are on the campus. I think it's one of the things that's been remarkable about the way you've approached this project is that I just, I see you sitting down and talking with folks, coming to events, talking with folks, and um, I'm fascinated by that. But are, are students part of that for you? And have you had opportunities to work with them and introduce them to what's happening on your team? Yes and no. I'm certainly trying to meet just personally as many people as I can because everyone's got some small or large piece of the institutional memory here. I can't and shouldn't start from scratch. So I'm constantly going around. There are an enormous number of people here, as you know, not just in your program, but Hopkins Retrospective and Inheritance Baltimore and various other programs and individuals working on the past of this place. And I'm trying to learn as much as I can, as quickly as I can, uh, about those stories that they're finding. Students are an interesting question. I, uh, we decided in, in structuring our oral histories that I wouldn't talk to any, any current students, um, but those who graduate, I think are fair game. And so there's gonna be a fair amount of uh, learning from recent alums. I have lists already of alums to contact and I've talked to some folks uh, involved in activism and things like that that can tell me some of the, the, the most recent stories as well. So that's very much gonna be a part of it. It's a difficult thing with every university history to try to integrate students, faculty, administration. They seem like different streams and different stories mm -hmm. sometimes. And you don't want the story of student life to be just who was allowed to come and who wasn't. But it's also, you know, how much do you want to get into the details of this fraternity versus that fraternity? So you have to find ways of telling larger stories that don't devolve into sets of details and that do bear some relation to what's happening in the other parts. Uh, and that's that's a challenge. There's no two ways about it. It's always hard. It's something we're facing. It's something other university historians have faced, but it can be done and it's, it's fun to figure out how to do it. Well, we've just come off an alumni weekend um, at the Homewood campus. And I spent Friday evening with the members of the Society of Black Alumni and um, there's nothing but stories, right? I, you know, you're, you're, you know, just, you know, push the button, open the door, you know, say hello. And it's extraordinary. You're right that um, there are um, remarkable stories, many of which, you know, I certainly had never heard before. Um, and so I, I appreciate the, the challenge of um, wanting to be inclusive and also trying to um, figure out where the threads are. I think I have time for one more quick question. Um, and this one comes from Greg Britton. Um, and I, I like this one as a place to end. And, and part of what um, Greg asked is, um, I'm going to I'm going to take a little license with your question, Greg, is, is it true that with a biography of McDonough, it's clear where one might end the story, um, and perhaps less true um, when writing the history of Hopkins? Um, in both cases, I think, how close to the present do you, do you bring the story, or are these histories um, that really come right up to the present day? Maybe, Dr. Lipartito, you want to take a yeah, although, although it's 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 not exactly clear <laughs> because yeah. you have his afterlife as a long gone and in the grave, and yet his his body is literally dis, you know disinterred from Greenwood Cemetery to serve to serve as the uh, basis of the monument that that then for generations students would have to lay uh, flowers and wreaths at his gr uh, grave on uh, Founder's Day, which you can imagine for uh, the students when it became a uh, 
a segregated institution for the African American students was not necessarily a pleasant uh, experience. They did finally put an end to that about three years ago. So uh, I think I think there's a kind of soft, I guess I'd say a soft ending, right, in which you come up, you know, close to the present, and then and then have a, a more of an epilogue type in which you sort of give enough information about the state of the institution at its present moment so that perhaps the past and what's changed you know becomes clear like you could say you know without being too teleological you could say that this this all of these developments all of these changes all of these challenges that they've had to overcome all these reinventions of itself as an institution have now you know culminated in in where it is uh, today. And, and some of that has to do with the fact that the McDonough School is, in fact, a pretty diverse for, for a expensive private school. It's a rather diverse institution. And I think that's a product of some deliberate history. It's also an institution that serves a, uh, uh, it's pretty effective at serving a, a diverse socioeconomic group, many, many scholarship students. And they see that as the legacy of John McDonough's original bequest, that it would be, it would be free to poor children of of Baltimore, so I so I think there are certain perhaps uh, positive legacies that can be drawn out in how the institution looks today. Dr. Jewett, yeah, I think that I would give some of the same kind of answer. I mean, you you write the present, but you write it differently as in a story. And on the one hand, we're not particularly good, maybe not terribly good at all, uh, including myself at writing about fairly recent things. Um, but I also get frustrated when I see a book that comes up to 1950 or 1980 or 2000 and says the story's over, nothing has changed since then, because clearly that's not true. And I, I think in this particular case for the mandate, as I understand it, is to write about 150 years of Hopkins history. And to me, if something comes up the day before we turn it in and it's important to understanding the story, I'm going to try to get it in there somehow. It, this actually was the case with my last book. I had the proofs when the COVID pandemic broke out mm -hmm. and I was able to put it right at the beginning and the end to say, well, here's another really important frame for thinking about the kinds of issues we've got here. Uh, but again, also you write very differently about the present moment. You write much more tentatively, you write much more generally, you're much more inclined to talk about these were the things people were arguing about uh, rather than looking towards any resolution or trying to impose one's own views on it, if even if it seems relatively simple from a moral perspective. So there's a, you know, and historians have also practiced that as a way of sort of writing in a, in a more tentative vein, but indicating what the main lines of historical development are and where they're going to be going. What's, what's important now for thinking about five, 10, 15 years in the future. Yeah. It's my job to wrap us up. Um, there are more questions and more conversation, but um, I want to thank you both for this uh, remarkable opportunity and your your willingness, your openness to talk about this work, very much work in progress um, with still questions yet to be answered um, in your own thinking about these projects. Um, it's really been an honor to have you with us. So thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm going to invite Ellie back, who I think is going to um, wrap us up. Thanks so much, Ellie. Thank you, Dr. Jerry, Dr. Lee Partito, and Dr. Jones for this conversation. It's been so rich and just such an honor to, to have you here and hear about what you're working on and appreciate the way that um, your projects are kind of shedding a lot of light on the questions that we're asking at Hard Histories. Um, the collective remarks and um, just like the sort of goals and obstacles about writing institutional history and biography have been fascinating to me. Hearing about the project origins, collaboration practices, timelines, engagement across communities of historians and different audiences, as well as your thoughts on academic freedom and archival engagement have really prompted, I think, important reflections for us. Um, in particular, taking on the understated roles of race and racism in the history of higher education and being willing to connect your historical research to present social and political issues resonate super strongly with our work. Um, all of this in mind, the, the challenge of really shaping those narratives um, and taking on the opportunities to engage with and shape institutional legacies seem like crucial takeaways from your discussion. And I think continuing to see how you determine the scope and sources of the projects and, and navigate the possible receptions from your different audiences will be um, nuanced steps to take on. And, and again, really 
exciting for us to watch. So thank you both again. Um, I'll really look forward to those books coming out in 2026. Um, I'd also like to thank our audience for watching, for sending in the questions and to the SNF Agora Institute team for your support. Um, you can learn more about hard histories at Hopkins at hardhistory.jhu.edu. Additional information about our event series, as well as YouTube videos of our past events is posted at snfagora.jhu.edu slash event. We're thrilled to announce our final event of the semester on April 26th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. Students from Dr. Jones's Spring 2023 Hard Histories Lab will present their research from the semester. Registration details are available now in the chat. Please also subscribe to the Substack at hardhistoriesjhu.substack.com, where we regularly post updates about what we're doing. Thanks again, and have a great rest of the day. See you in a couple weeks.